Welcome to the Well-Versed Podcast from Vintage Church. This is episode four. My name is Jasmine Denton. And I'm Matt Smith. And we're ready to get started. Right. Today, we continue to walk through the I Am statements of Jesus as we're in season one Mm -hmm. of this new podcast. Right now, it's the Lent season of 2023, and we're walking towards Easter. And we thought in a cool way to do that as we're preparing our hearts, our minds to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus was to see what he said about himself. Yeah, because when we see Jesus for who he really is, through who he said he is, Correct. Uh, we can appropriately set our hearts um, to not only what he offers us, um, it can point us to our own brokenness, uh, which is also part of the season of Lent. Um, and I I don't have a favorite gospel, but I do love the gospel of John. Um, they each bring a unique you know, perspective, um, obviously you know, written by four different authors, but uh, John's is the latest Correct. Uh, written. And uh, at the end of his gospel, he tells us that like, he's super intentional mm. about the stories that he has pieced together. His, his gospel is in a different, almost different order than the other ones, because what he's trying to do is he's trying to help you connect all of these these dots. Um, and he says in, in John 20, verse 30, he says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Mm-hmm. And so he's very intentionally crafted this gospel yeah. uh, to, to paint a message, to to help us to be able to believe that Jesus is who he said he was. And so as we're going through this gospel, um, not only are we wanting to look at the way that he put all of these things together, you know, we're, we're certainly looking at who did Jesus say these things to? Um, what was the context of what was going on in the moment? How does John sandwich these statements between events and um, things going on in Jesus's day and time? But also as part of this podcast, we want to help people to see that this, you can't just start in the New Testament that what what John does, what any of the gospel authors do, and really what any of the authors of the the Hebrew Bible, what they're doing, they are assuming a lot that uh, the people who encountered Jesus in this day and age would have known the Hebrew Bible, would have known that there was a greater context for uh, for what Jesus was saying, and so um, I think that we lose some of that mm-hmm. in our modern day reading yeah. that um, that we, not that I think that you, I mean, you can't, re- you can read something like I'm the light of the world. And I, I think we get like what that means, but there would have been a whole lot that that statement would have unlocked right. for the people in Jesus's time. Yeah, uh, man, we could spend a whole podcast unpacking the the way and the reason why each gospel writer wrote the way that they did. Yes. And each each had the same goal. All three gospel writers had the same goal was mm-hmm. to either solidify the faith that you already had in Jesus or to bring you to faith in Jesus. They wrote with a different audience in mind, each one. Mm. You know, you had... Matthew, which was very intentional about trying to lead people who were steeped in the Jewish faith, help them see that Jesus is the fulfillment of that. And and all of his gospel, from his genealogy, going back to Abraham, every bit of the tone of Matthew is for that reason. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mark has a very different view because of uh, it's written by somebody that was very much uh, discipled by Peter, mm-hmm. and it's through that lens. And and John and and John has kind of always been my favorite as mm-hmm. well. As we're we're right now in our church um, in a season of of Lent, walking through the Gospel of Luke, and the yeah. more that I've studied the Gospel of Luke, the, 
kind of more quickly, it's kind of coming my favorite because it's, awesome. it's such a unique. And if you're at Venice Church, you're, you're hearing about that now. But John is very, he, he is the last to write. And I think some of this, he's like, everybody else has written theirs. Let me share you some, with you some things that didn't yeah. happen. And continuing to keep in mind the very unique relationship that John had with mm-hmm. Jesus. You know, obviously Jesus had a large group of followers. Luke records that he goes up on a mountain one night Jesus does and prays, right. then he comes down and picks these 12 guys among those that have been following him to be the disciples, the apostles, the ones he's gonna more intensely and intentionally kind of invest in. Mm-hmm. And then even among that 12, you had Peter, and then you had John and his brother James, mm-hmm. the sons of thunder, as they're known, the sons of, of Zebedee. And yeah, so John is is the one that very intentionally kind of strings these I am statements together that we've Mm -hmm. been looking at. And today we're in the gospel of John chapter eight, and we hear him say he is the light of the world. Yeah. And you want me to read it? Yeah, please. So I'm reading from the CSB. Once again, this is a podcast that's maybe not a drive time podcast. Yep. So hopefully you've got your Bible out and you're walking with us. It's John chapter eight, uh, verse 12. It says, Jesus spoke to them, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to them, you are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not valid. Verse 14. And there's a reason why I'm reading all this. Please, yeah. Even if I testify about myself, Jesus replied, my testimony is true because I know where I came from and where I'm going, but you don't know where I come from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I judge no one. That the context with in which he says this is super important. Yes. And this is the one that... Uh, uh, I guess we, I don't know, there's one I am statement that people have focused in on more than others, but sure. I am the light of the world. And and it happens in this in this season where the intensity between Jesus and the Pharisees is beginning to boil up. Mm-hmm. If you go back into chapter seven, that you, you see this this encounter, it's at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, mm-hmm. which would, was this big Jewish celebration. Mm-hmm. Again, there was all these festivals that were connected to the Passover, connected to God leading through Moses, the nation of Israel, Israel out of Egypt into the wilderness toward the promised land. And they had these, these parties, these big festivals. These celebrations, yeah. Celebrations to commemorate this. And mm-hmm. this is, it might in some Bibles say uh, uh, the Feast of Shelters or the mm-hmm. Feast of Tabernacles. Mm-hmm. And it was to commemorate this season in the history of the Jewish nation, the nation of Israel, where God was with them mm-hmm. in this season. So these, there was a lot happening at this time. But if you read chapter seven, you see some very intense counters, encounters beginning to happen between Jesus and the Pharisees. And that is kind of, in many of these I am statements, that seems to be the audience. Yeah. It's these religious people who are very much versed in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, yep. and the prophets. Yep. And so a lot of these things that Jesus was saying would be very much triggers for them yes. because of what they they knew the Old Testament references. Mm-hmm. And it comes back to what you said early, the importance of the scriptures, Genesis to Revelation, this cumulative view that we must have, that we cannot untether ourselves from the Old Testament right. yeah. because the old Jesus is is leveraging the the Old Testament scriptures yeah. as evidence that he is something different. Yeah. So when he says, I am the light of the world, alarm bells start going off for, sure. for these religious leaders. And uh, let's talk about some of these things mm-hmm. that may have started coming to mind. When he says, I am the light of the world, what are some things that, that you found that you feel like this is yeah. This is where we'd go back to? Uh, go to Isaiah 42. Okay. And while while you're getting there, while Jasmine's getting there, at some point I would love us to talk about what happens right before verse 12 of chapter eight, because there's a story there that- Okay, do you, do you wanna talk about that? We can, I do wanna talk about it. Do you wanna talk about it now? Yeah, well, okay, let's go ahead and talk about that now. Okay. We'll stay in this, so we'll stay in the present context because he says it twice. He says, I'm the light of the world two different times. Yes. Right behind two different stories. Right. Okay, so what do you want to talk about with the beginning of John chapter eight? Well, John chapter eight, verses one through, or, or really Isaiah, I mean, 
John 7, 7 53, 53 yes. through 8, 11, 11. Uh-huh. are, there's a lot of controversy over, over that this story yeah. and its placement. Correct. And if, you, if, you're, if you're using a study Bible, there's a good chance that maybe it says somewhere that this is not present in many of the earliest manuscripts. Right. Yeah. So how the Bible was put together was, you know, and this was 400 years or so after, after Jesus yep you know, death, resurrection, ascension, that all these writings were beginning to circulate among the church, among the body. Mm -hmm. You had the letters of Paul, you had all these different things. But as you can imagine, this is a significant event in human history. And there was a lot of things written about these events. Mm -hmm. And so a group of really smart people and really scholarly people decided to come together to create a criteria for what would be in the Bible we have now, the, what was known as the canonized scripture. Right. And there was a super high bar for that. There had to be, there, and you can, we don't have time to get into all the things that were there. Well, in, in this time when they're, they're, they're putting together scripture, uh, for years you had maybe 10,000 or 20,000 manuscript, ancient manuscripts of, of like the gospel of John. Right. And in some of the later manuscripts that were found, this story that happens in, in, in John 7.53 through John 8.11 were present, but in some of the earliest, it weren't. Right. So that begs the question, okay, well, why is it in there? Yep. And some people think it shouldn't be. Right. Uh, some people think maybe it should be there, but they question the placement. Because if you read yes. seven, chapter 7, verses 1 through 52, 52, and then you pick up in 8, 12, it seems to be a natural flow. Right. But one of the things I will say if you read it, and essentially the, the, the summary of that story is there's a woman caught in adultery. They, the, the religious Pharisees bring her to Jesus and want to know what should be done. And that's this thing of Jesus bends down and mm-hmm. he writes in the sand and says, if, you're, all right, the one if, without, mm-hmm. if you've never sinned, then you can go ahead and start throwing rocks. Right. And everybody walks away. Mm-hmm. The one thing for me is, number one, whether the story is true or not, mm-hmm. I, think, I think it's highly likely. Right. I think there's a reason why later on they put it in to the, to the right. scriptures the way we have mm-hmm. it. When you look through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the tone of the Pharisees in that story is definitely one we see is very evident of how they would right. have been. Everyone is acting within character according to, to, put it. to the rest of the gospels. Right. Yeah, so no, nothing is out of character. Um, nothing is condoned here that is, con- that is you know, condemned anywhere else, nor is anything condemned here that is condoned somewhere else. So everything is, is in line with the way that Jesus taught and the way that the people would and have received. the friction received. that you see yes. between Jesus yeah. and the Pharisees and, and what creates that tension yes. of this, the Pharisees, high and mighty, self-righteous, judgmental, mm-hmm. and Jesus very much leaning into uh, their hypocrisy, calling them out for it and, and yeah. those kinds of things. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so that so that's where it's placed in our Bible, in this in this gospel is right before he says, I'm the light of the world. And then in John nine, when he says it, it's right after he heals a man who's born blind. blind. Yeah. So two different kinds of darkness. Yeah. A sinful kind of darkness with the woman caught in adultery mm. and then a physical blindness um, that is healed. Uh after which Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Uh, so even you know, in those two situations, we very quickly see what Jesus is saying. When I, I am the light of the world, I am here to walk you out of darkness, whether it's a spiritual darkness or a physical darkness, um, like I'm that light for you to follow. I, and he says, you know, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. Mm-hmm. Um, and Again, like we were saying, like these alarm bells start going off in the people who were listening. You, t- you were going to take us to Isaiah. Do you want to go there? We can. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's there's so many things that of this theme of light woven throughout. Oh yeah. The the scriptures. I even think going back to Genesis one 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 two. Yep. Where it's mm-hmm. you know there. It, he formed the world and it was dark. Then he said, he spoke, let there be light. Mm-hmm. And then you think about John 1, 1, yes. in the beginning was the word and all the light that's there. Mm-hmm. But 
as it pertains to the context of when Jesus says it Mm -hmm. with these Pharisees present Mm -hmm. who are still not connecting the dots and seeing Jesus as a Messiah. They see him as yet another because there had been many Mm -hmm. guy who had kind of stepped on the scene and was making all these huge claims. And now he's saying he can forgive sins and do all these things. And this tension is rising. But when Jesus says that, their minds would have gone back to several places in Isaiah that, that point to, to the Messiah and what he will do. And I, one of the first ones that came to mind for me is, is Isaiah 42. I'll start reading with verse six and read down through verse seven. So if you got your Bible, flip over Isaiah 42, starting with verse five. So this is what the Lord says, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. I am the Lord. I have called you for a righteous purpose and I will hold you by your hand. I will watch over you and I will appoint you to be a covenant for the people and a light to the nations in order to open blind eyes Mm. and to bring our prisoners from the dungeon and those sitting in darkness from the prison house. So there you see the two times that you just mentioned, Mm -hmm. John 8, John 9, where he says, I am the light of the world in the context of these Pharisees and possibly on the other side of this encounter with the woman caught in adultery, Mm -hmm. then healed a blind man. Mm -hmm. And then he said, and right there, verse seven, in order to open, or latter part of verse six, and a light to the nations in order to open blind eyes and to bring out prisoners from the dungeon. Mm -hmm. In other words, Jesus is saying, the light that Isaiah point, pointed to, I'm him. That's me. Yeah. I don't think that, and <laughs> I haven't thought this through, so let me talk it out. Uh, I don't think then that it's a coincidence that Jesus has done this on the Sabbath. Oh, absolutely not. You know, so he heals a blind man on the Sabbath. Right. And his whole thing is like, the Sabbath is for restoration. And so he is bringing this man to, to restoration, mm. uh, which is in keeping then with the Sabbath. And, and so when you talk about, um, you know, those sitting in darkness from the prison house, like that, that you're, you're bringing people out of oppression, you're bringing people out of, you know, shame and you're bringing them into a place of, of restoration. Mm. Uh, and so, and even like just the connection of of light and Sabbath and Sabbath is marked by like lighting of candles. And so like there's all of this that's woven in together, you know? Even at this time with the Feast of Tabernacles, it pointed back to when when the the nation of Israel is traveling mm-hmm. from, from Egypt to the promised land. Yes. God led them by light. Yes. Fire by day, a cloud, like a, a, a cloud glowing by day. cloud mm-hmm. d- during the day and then fire at night. Yeah. And so even the timing of this, and, and you can study all that they would do in the fe- during the Feast of Tabernacles as far yeah. as how that, what would happen in the temple courts and the lighting of these candelabras. Yeah. So you would have this glow coming from the temple mm-hmm. during this season because of they would be commemorating that the light of God leading the nation of Israel towards something better. Yeah. And it's, it's not, God, Jesus is very intentional mm-hmm. with when and how and where he says these things. Yeah. Um, so let's go back to Exodus 13 mm. because God didn't just make a cloud appear or a pillar of fire appear and was like, here, I'm gonna give this to y'all so that you'll have a light to see. He says, um, this is verse 21 of chapter 13. It says, the Lord went ahead of them. Mm in a pillar of cloud to lead them on their way during the day and in a pillar of cloud or a pillar of fire to give them light at night Mm -hmm. uh, so that they could travel day or night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night never left its place in front of the people. Uh, And so there are a lot of people who even think like that whole pillar of cloud, pillar of fire is actually the second person of the Trinity. Like it's not just... Yeah. like a random flame that's that's going like this is the actual presence of of God mm-hmm. um and specifically the the second person of God who we call you know Jesus God mm-hmm. the son um so yeah all of that would have been there and especially you're right like the the feast of tabernacles um 
one of the ways that they commemorated that was was by building these little tabernacles, like, or not, uh, sorry, booths. Um, they would build like these little uh, tents mm-hmm. and almost like reenact what happened during right. that time. Man, we don't, I just don't think we celebrate very well. I think yeah. about that, I'm like, man, they, they like really, they wanted to remember in every way. And so Jesus is saying like, don't just remember living in a tent. Mm-hmm. Like remember who you were following mm-hmm. and like you, you can keep following him. Um, one of the things that was interesting for me in, in kind of researching this was the connection to Hanukkah. And this isn't something that we talk about a lot. Um, I think in a lot of ways in our Western Christian culture, we have... Um, it's like we felt some need to completely separate those From two Judaism. Things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, you know, Hanukkah's not Jewish Christmas. Right. It's a totally different right. different thing. It happens to fall the same time of year. Right. Um, but like Jesus would have celebrated Hanukkah. Mm-hmm. Um, John chapter 10, it talks about that it was the time of the, the feast of the dedication. That's it. That's the, that's the festival of mm-hmm. lights. So Jesus would have grown up in this, um, this culture of like lights really meant something. And when you think of like for us, lights like, yeah, whatever, we've got lights everywhere, right. you know? Yeah. Um, but for them, like when it was dark, it was dark. There was you know, the lights of the sky. Here, all of our artificial lights drown out the natural lights. Mm. Um, But this whole idea of in a season when, you know, we call it this like the silent period, that intertestamental period, um, like God was still working and like some major things were going on in the in the Jewish nation during that time. They had been conquered. Um, their temple had been completely desecrated. They were not allowed to worship in any way. They were not allowed to celebrate any, any of these festivals. Um, they weren't allowed to circumcise their kids, um, like their boys. Um, I heard that when... Uh, like a, a baby was born, that if they took the baby to be circumcised and it was found out that the mother and the child would be killed and then basically put on public mm-hmm. display. So like this was a time when worship of their Yahweh God like was not possible. Mm-hmm. Um, the like the ruler at that time uh, took pigs into the Holy of Holies in the temple, slaughtered them, desecrated the entire thing. Wow. Like it was a terrible, terrible time. And so, um, you know, without going into the whole everything. Well, you can even like, see like the rebound effect of the yeah, Pharisees. Yes. That, oh. that when, when, when you go through that season, when everything that you valued and everything that was connected to your, your belief system and yeah. all the tradition that had meant so much to your ancestors had been stripped away. And then you had the opportunity to start bringing it back. Mm-hmm. There's no wonder that some of these, and I'm not trying to give them a pass, but just trying no. to, it doesn't justify what they did, but it right. explains yeah. some of the mentality they had of the, the, the very dogmatic and dramatic way yeah. that they wanted to preserve and protect because anything that was a threat to that tradition Mm. they wanted to extinguish. And that's how they saw Jesus. Yeah. Instead of a continuation of or fulfillment of that tradition and all that, they saw it as a threat. Mm -hmm. And it's that rebound effect. And we still are guilty of that. We we swing to these pendulums in in our Mm -hmm. mindsets. And and it's no wonder that when Jesus says, I'm the light of the world, they don't think about Isaiah 42 or Isaiah 49. Hmm. Isaiah 49 is another one. Isaiah 49 uh, verses five through six. Again, there's, you know, especially Isaiah 42, Isaiah 49, and Isaiah 53 are very much God pointing to the coming Messiah. Isaiah 49, 5. And now says the Lord, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, so that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God is my strength. He says, it is not enough for you to be my servant, raising up the tribes of Jacob and restoring the protected ones of Israel. I will make you a light for the nations to be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Mm. There's this language of light that's tethered to God's prophetic messages about the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And that's why Jesus was so intentional. I am that light. 
Yeah. So then what do you do with, or why do you think it is that this one I am statement, I am the light of the world. It's also the, a title or a role that he gives to us. In Matthew 5, he says, you are the light of the world. We're, we're not called the bread of life. We're not called the, the good shepherd. You know, we're not the resurrection and the life. But he does say, you are the light of the world. A city that's up on a hill cannot be hidden. Um, why do you think mm. with this one I am statement, he shares that with the people who follow him? I think about the way John opens his gospel. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm gonna get there. Okay. But if you go back to John 1.1, 1, 1, you see that, that those two things, what you just said, really resonated with John. Mm-hmm. Because the way he opens his gospel and the way he opens John, go read John 1 and 1 John 1. Okay. And you see this, again, this language of light. Mm-hmm. Verse six of chapter or no, start in the beginning was verse one of chapter one. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him speaking about and God spoke and it was things were created. Mm -hmm. And apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness and yet the darkness did not overcome it. And then verse nine, the true light gives light to everyone who is coming into the world. Just go into John chapter one and the first 10 or 15 verses and circle everywhere you see that word light, 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 light. And it's this reminder of God's intention for us to reflect him. Mm. That you go back to number one, we were made in his image. Mm -hmm. So we were created to reflect him. And then you think about you are the light of the world, that we, we don't have a light in and of ourselves. We're not the source. But, you know, a year or so ago, we talked about this in in our church and we talked about the moon, Mm -hmm. that the moon is dependent on the sun in order to be bright. Yeah. That it does not have a source of its own. But God's desire to to have us reflect who he is, Mm -hmm. reflect his nature, reflect his character, you know, be ambassadors as Paul says. Mm -hmm. And so if he is light, he wants us to reflect and project that same light into the world in which we are we are in now in order to bring people to the understanding of who he is that he hoped he would create through these I am statements in the culture in which he lived. Hmm. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. Yeah, it makes absolute sense. And when I think of that image of a city on a hill, like a city is bright because it's made of many lights, Mm. you know? Yeah, it's collective. Um, It's a collective Mm. light. And uh, like, yes, we're we're not the source of that light, but, you know, as Jesus is not here in flesh dwelling among us like he was in, Mm. you know, in John's gospel, we are here dwelling in the flesh and he is dwelling in us. And, And we do have that, that privilege and that responsibility to to shine his light right. um, to point people to him. Um, one of the other parts of scripture that um, we we've actually talked about a lot here, um, Psalm one nineteen one hundred five. It says, "Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path." And you know when <laughs> when you think about Jesus being the Word, the Logos, mm-hmm. you know your Word is a lamp mm. to my feet and a light for my path. Mm. That, you know, it's all of these places where we see word and light connected. Connect, yeah. Um, yeah. It's not a coincidence, you know, God spoke like his word, the first word spoken was let there be light. That was the very first thing, um, a promise that there would always be light in the darkness. Um, and then that, that God's word, what he said, what he is, has spoken in an authoritative way and what he is still speaking in that Holy Spirit, um, you know, to us kind of way is what illuminates our path, is what teaches us how to walk. And that 
you know, we, we read that I'm the light of the world, those who follow, like you'll never walk in darkness. That doesn't mean that you won't have dark times, you know? Right, yeah. That there will, you will experience darkness. But the promise is that there will always be light. Like the, not that it will be easy, not that you won't have suffering or anything like that, but like you, it, you will not be in the dark. Right. Um, I don't know. And so there's, there's just a lot of hope for mm, me um, when, when we talk about light. Uh, and actually kind of going back to the, the Hanukkah thing, one of the things I read, um, Josephus, who was a, a contemporary historian, historian. Um, when he's talking about Hanukkah, he ends his section of um, talking about this festival. And he says, and from that time to the present, we observe this festival, which we call the Festival of Lights. Giving this name to it, I think from the face or from the fact that the right to worship appeared to us at a time when we dared, when we hardly dared hope for it. And I love that. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes when you're in that dark place, like you hardly dare to hope for light, mm-hmm. um, you know, to hope for it, an end to the suffering. Uh, but Jesus is that hope. He is that light of the world. Uh, and like, just like you just keep looking up and, I don't know. Gosh, it's, it's, it just sounds so corny and cliche, but like he, he, it's there. Like if you open your eyes, you fix your eyes on him, like he's there. Right. Um, so that was the other That's thing good. that I thought about was just that connection of, of word and light yeah. throughout the gospel yeah. and just the hope that we have in that. Right, yeah. And you know, for me, I think sometimes we look at these I am statements and we think more about that app, kind of application. As I'm doing this, it's, it's, more, it's less about application and more about affirmation. Mm of Jesus is who he says he was. Hmm. That, you know, we can very look at, you know, unpacking all the things, yeah. you know, we could spend this podcast talking about all that light does, the warmth that it gives, the sure. way it exposes, all this kind of stuff. But as we continue to walk through these, I'm reminded that Jesus' intent was, I want you to see me. Hmm. I want you to see me and, you, and you're missing it. And I'm trying my best to continue to point you to these ancient realities that affirm who I am, I am, <laughs> and stop resisting. And that's, mm-hmm. I think, our hope as, as you guys are watching this, that as, because we're walking towards Resurrection Sunday, Easter, mm-hmm. and I hope that this is serving as affirmation that the God that we're going to celebrate on that Easter Sunday is, is real and Jesus is who he says he is. Yeah, it's good. All right. Cool deal. Good? Yeah. All right, y'all. Thank you so much for listening to episode four. We would really appreciate it if you would take just a minute to go rate this podcast, five stars, please, and share it with your people on social media or however you share all the things. Uh, But that does it. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Bye.